Hello, and welcome everybody to the National Trends in Disability Employment, or NTID, Lunch and Learn series. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. We will post an archive of each webinar each month on our website at www.researchondisability.org slash NTIDE. This site will also provide copies of the presentations, the speakers' bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer. To ask questions of the speakers, click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Speakers will review these questions and provide answers during the last section of the webinar. Some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A box. If you have any questions following this recording, please contact us at disability.statistics at unh.edu or toll free at 866-538-9521 for more information. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy, Enjoy today's, today's webinar. webinar. Hi, this is Andrew Haltenberg from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, the Lunch and Learn is a joint effort for, with the University of New Hampshire Kessler Foundation and the Association of People, the Association of Centers on uh, Disability (AUCD). We occur at noontime Eastern Time on um, the first Friday of each month, uh, with uh, the release of the Entide Report, which is typically released around 10 o'clock, 10:30 uh, in the morning on the first Friday. Um, a part of the uh, the Untied Lunch and Learn is a part of the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Employment Policy and uh, Measurement, which is funded by the National Institute on uh, Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, uh, also known as NIDLER. Uh, the first part will be the numbers. Um, I'll be talking, uh, John O'Neill unfortunately was unable to connect this morning, so I'll be going over the numbers. Then we'll have uh, Entide News from Denise Roselle at AUCD. And we have uh, guest speakers, Kelly Nylingerman and uh, Dave Johnson from the University of Minnesota. And one note is that Kelly uh, will be, uh, is uh, transitioning and she will actually be at the University of New Hampshire as the director of our um, Institute on Disability here uh, coming up in the summer. So we're looking forward to that. And it would be great to hear from Kelly today. Um, and uh, uh, and Dave as well. So uh, the fourth part is all is Q and A. So you can ask questions from parts one, two, and three. Uh, and as the recording in the beginning said, uh, you can also ask questions uh, in the Q and A box, and they may be answered as we go along. So uh, let me introduce the end tide since John couldn't uh, do, uh, uh, join us today. Uh, so the NTIDE, if you're not familiar, is a monthly uh, report or press release uh, with an infographic that looks at the latest statistics. We use data from the jobs report that is released by the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, which occurs on the first Friday of each month. Uh, the BLS uses the current population survey, which is the official source of the unemployment unemployment rate, the uh, official unemployment rate. And so you may have heard news uh, this morning about the unemployment rate. Um, we're a little bit different. Uh, we focus on uh, people, uh, civilians ages 16 to 64. The unemployment rate you hear in the news is usually 16 plus. So uh, we restrict uh, 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 to 16 to 64 because we don't want to confuse uh, disability that's related to aging as opposed to disability that's say early onset or work related. Um, we have data available going back to September 2008. That's when they first started uh, collecting data on the population with disabilities, they meaning the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, we have not yet seasonally adjusted, uh, so that's why we compare it to the same time last year. Uh, and uh, you know, seasonal adjustment actually takes, we're almost up to 11 years of data. Uh, it actually takes many, many years of data to seasonally adjust, and we'll probably wait until the Bureau of Labor Statistics does it because uh, it's a very, very complex process. Uh, so the numbers. So this month, uh, we actually had a good month uh, by all measures. Uh, the employment to population ratio, so the percentage of people who are employed, uh, went up from, for people with disabilities, went up from 30.0, so 30%, uh, to 39.0. 9%, so almost a full percentage point. For people without disabilities, it also went up 
uh, from 74.1% to 74.8%. So this is compared to the same time last year. Um, for those that are paying attention to the news about the coronavirus, um, uh, you know, that, that is not yet expected to have impact on the labor market in the United States in a big way. Um, although from my perspective at UNH, I see that many administrators at UNH are really focusing on, on preparing uh, for potential issues related to the virus. And, you know, our HR processes are slowing down. So uh, hiring might, might slow down uh, for large organizations that are trying to prepare. Uh, the labor force participation rate, so we also had good measurement, uh, good, ish, good results there. Uh, it went up from 33.3% to 33.8%. So this is the percentage of people who are not just working, but also actively looking for work. Uh, so they're considered part participating in the labor market because they're um, actively looking for work in the last four weeks. Uh, this measure also went up for people with dis without disabilities from 77.1% to 77 uh, 0.7%. So uh, we like to look at the trend line for in the employment to population ratio. And so this, this, the beginning of this line is really the start of the Great Recession. Uh, so you see the dip for people with disabilities and people without disabilities. Of course, you see the gap between people with, the, with and without disabilities, which is substantial. So at the beginning of the Great Recession, it was 73.8% and only 30 2.7% for people with disabilities. That gap has been, you know, present in data that I've seen going back to the 70s. Um, and what you see is a sharp decline, but then a slow, steady recovery for people without disabilities. And so uh, what, what that would be would be the recovery uh, from the recession. And many people, you may remember that there was kind of very slow, rapid growth in the economy uh, during Obama's uh, latter six years and then into the Trump administration. It's not, job growth has not been, you know, uh, going by leaps and bounds uh, in, in large part because we are butting up against what's called full employment where, um, uh, uh, where, where there, there aren't many uh, job openings being filled uh, because we're at full employment. But for people with dis without disabilities, you see the recovery didn't start until several years, uh, one, two, three, four, five years, at least after the recovery that started for people with disabilities. And it started going up. And so 2006, 2017 were really, really good years. And we've really seen a leveling off over the last, uh, say, um, uh, uh, two years, 2008, 2019. 2018, it's hard to see in this chart, but the gap between people with and without disabilities has narrowed the last three months. Um, so that's been, been good, it's a good sign, but, uh, but uh, to, to say that we've returned to kind of an upward trend, uh, it's way, way too soon to say that. Um, and so, um, you know, that's the way the, the trend has looked over the last 10 or so years for uh, last 10 plus years for people with and without disabilities. Um, I, you know, it, just one last note on this trend line, this upswing in 2006, 2017, that's really when this economy started to move into full employment. So what that suggests is that employers were going um, after people, markets, groups of people that they hadn't considered before. But also uh, that's when people started seeing uh, help wanted signs in their neighborhoods and perhaps people with transportation related uh, barriers uh, that was less so as jobs became more and more open in their local area. Uh, that's just kind of a thought. The last thing I wanna say, I said, I know I said one more thing, but the last thing I'd say is this uptick between 2016 and 17, and some of the data I've been working with on in a paper I'm writing, this is really the first time we've actually seen this increase. Um, uh, and, you know, it slowed down during the decrease in uh, the, the widening of the gap slowed down in previous full employment periods. This is actually the first time we ever saw the gap narrow. Uh, and so I hope to someday be able to present those results. Um, but uh, data is, before 2008, data is really sketchy. So it has to be done pretty careful. Um, all right, so oops, there's the trend line. Um, 
So now I'm going to turn it over to Denise Rizal at AUCD for the news. Take it away, Denise. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. So let's flip to the first slide. As you know, we always start with the federal policy update. Um, this is a, I guess everyone around there should, this is a very odd time in Washington. There's, there's stuff that is going on, um, but, but we're all, there always seems to be something that's sucking all the oxygen out of the air. And it's something different all the time. So right now it's the coronavirus. So let me just put that out there. So let me start at the top. I, I just want to give you a quick update. We talked about it last month. We're working on the 2021, or Congress is supposed to be working on the FY 2021 budget and appropriations. We've gotten the president's budget. Um, we here at AUCD, as well as others in the disability world, are working on getting um, recommendations. Actually, already have, we already have our recommendations to Congress on a variety of programs that um, that are of importance to us and to a variety of the people in the disability community. Um, I don't know that they're really working on it yet, but we are certainly sharing all of our information for those of you who are budget appropriations geeks or have particular issues that you're interested in. Starting now and moving forward and sharing um, your appropriations numbers is not a bad idea. They're starting to look at it. I don't anticipate we're going to have anything before um, they go home, which means the end of September. Well, the end of September. I doubt they'll be here that long in an election year. Um, but I don't know that they'll focus on it until later in the year. But it's not a bad time to share. And we, to let you guys know, we are sharing our numbers with folks on all of the programs we work on. Um, uh, the president's budget, and I said this last month as well, um, a number of things in there have been zeroed out. Um, if you go, there are places that we need to be fighting for funding. Um, some of them have been level funded. It's just, it's a, kind of a mixed bag as usual. Nothing with big increases, but that's not a surprise. So um, if you've got interest in appropriations, I, I would say that most of the disability organizations, whoever you connect with, certainly AUCD, if you go to our website, we've got our appropriations um, recommendations up there and, um, and recommendations based on the president's budget and other things that we're making. So that's kind of just keep you up to speed. Um, there's a new bill I want to tell you about briefly um, called the uh, Home and Community-Based Services Infrastructure Improvement Act. It's S-3277. It was introduced by Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. Um, and it's, it's interesting, and you, you probably are thinking, Denise, HCBS, that's not employment. Well, actually, in this case, it could be. Uh, and that's why I want to share it with you and, and promote it with you. They're looking for co-sponsors. I will say, I'm not sure that it's something that's going to be, um, nobody's going to pick it up and run fast with it this year, but we need to be pushing this. It's, it's an important, could be a really important change. What it provides is some federal funding for HCBS, um, home community-based services infrastructure that, and delivery systems um, on a state-by-state -state basis. And the things that it looks at, which is why I'm saying, and I'm looking through my notes here so that I can share that with you, um, why I'm saying it, the things that you can spend that money on um, to build infrastructure are connected to, or could be any of the following, connected to accessible, affordable housing. We know the impact of that on employment. Um, accessible, affordable, reliable transportation options. Obviously, we know the impact of that on transportation. Um, increased wages and benefits for direct service personnel. Obviously, we know the impact of that on um, unemployment. Um, expanding competitive integrated employment, obviously. And um, building comprehensive no wrong door um, application referral and counseling services. So there's some really interesting things in this. Um, I commend it to you. I tell you it's out there. I'm not sure this is one I would tell you is going to move this year, but, um, but it is out there and it's a really interesting way of getting some infrastructure funding. So I commend that to you. Um, and if you're talking to members of Congress about it, raising it with them and saying this is something we're interested in um, certainly would be good. Um, a quick update on Medicaid work requirements. Um, as, as you know, I hope, because uh, we've talked about once in a while, um, there, many states are trying to add work requirements to their Medicaid um, requirements, basically requiring that you be looking for work um, if you're going to receive Medicaid. Some of those are very specifically excluding people with disabilities, although even most of the definitions where they're doing that are not particularly good definitions, so 
they're pretty broad and people with disabilities can come into those as well as parents of kids with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. The work requirements are a real, sorry to say a real potential problem. They're a real problem for um, folks with disabilities. So and a couple of things happened in just this last couple of weeks. Michigan had a, um, had a work requirement they were trying to add that was just struck down by uh, a federal court in Michigan. So it's another one of the work requirements. So far, I think any, I think all of the work requirements that have been challenged have been struck down. That might not quite be right. Um, the other thing that we saw was the Arkansas work requirements that were struck down by a lower federal court eh, a year ago, maybe more. Um, the appellate court here in DC upheld, upheld the Arkansas court, um, federal court um, decision, which means that the appellate court has now struck down Medicaid work requirements, um, at least the DC appellate court. That's a big deal too. Um, basically, they're saying that when, when these laws were passed or when states tried to do this and take advantage of the administration's opening to approve these, because obviously these are in waivers and what's happened is um, the administration has approved these waivers and then challenges have happened. Um, so it's a, it's a statement saying that they didn't look at the effect on, the Medi on Medicaid or on the Medicaid population. And additionally, that these are not the purposes for which Medicaid was um, created. So these are a couple of big ones, particularly um, the Michigan one just happened uh, two days ago, maybe. Uh, the appellate court decision is kind of a big one. Um, we're beginning to see, I think we are seeing states moving away from this work requirement idea. Um, but to the extent the courts are, are coming out and saying, no, 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 you can't do this, that's also important in this world. I mentioned coronavirus at the top. Um, Andrew mentioned it. All I want to be saying to you right now is that, that you know, as I say, it's something is always sucking all the oxygen out of what's going on in Washington these days. For a while, it was the impeachment conversation. It certainly has been the election. Um, it certainly has been a variety of other things. Um, right now, it's the coronavirus seems to be sucking the air out of anything that's happening here. Um, that is, there people don't know. Basically, we don't have a lot of information. Congress passed a bill, um, and the president signed it to add a bunch of money to help promote um, a variety of things in the fight against this virus. Um, we're beginning to hear things, uh, certainly for this popular for this call, things to know about. Um, um, the effect on people with disabilities, the effect on people over 65, you're beginning to hear that in the news as well. But um, that's, we'll see what, what that means in the future. I don't know. I only put it here if I'm going to update you on what's happening on federal policy. That's something where there are a lot of conversations going on here. We don't know a lot, and we certainly don't know a lot about um, the effect on the population we care about. And then lastly, the election. Um, again, we don't talk about this in a partisan way at all. But clearly things are narrowing down. And I would say to you, um, to the extent that you are seeing people coming to your state, candidates coming to your state, of which there are obviously much fewer now, um, the effect that you can have by asking disability questions and by asking about their disability platforms would be huge. Um, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden, does not have a formal disability policy platform. So asking about that might be a good thing asking about positions on competitive integrated employment of all of the candidates would be a good thing. Um, asking for, for a variety of questions around home and community-based services would be a good thing. Um, you can dream up what those questions are, but as long as this is going on, as this election goes on, and we clearly have many more months to go, raising disability issues um, really promotes a conversation that we're beginning to see happening for in a very visible way for the first time. I, I would say in some ways for the first time in an election process. So putting that out there for those of you who haven't had your, um, your primary yet, um, and then later once we have a general election, I think I may just keep saying this to you guys over and over again. Keep asking the questions, it does make a difference. Okay, next slide. Um, and there we go. Um, there's a notice of um, a request, basically, for comments from the Department of Education, RSA, um, that came out just in the last, uh, it was published in the Federal Register Friday the 28th, so just last Friday. Um, it is asking for comment, it has to do with federal funding and federal use of PREATS, pre-employment transition service dollars, 
Uh, comments are due March 30th. Again, I think any of the organizations that you work with, certainly AUCD, I'm guessing APSI, I'm guessing all sorts of, of the other organizations that you work with around um, employment, will be looking at this and making comments. We will have some draft comments ultimately that we will share. Um, it does two things, or it asks for comments on two things. One is clarifying current policy about vocational rehabilitation spending of pre-ETS money for auxiliary aids and services. Um, and from what I've looked at, and I have to say, honestly, I was on vacation all the way through Wednesday. So I haven't really done a deep dive in this, but I will. Um, it, it looks like it, it's promoting the idea, as it should, that um, if, you, if someone needs auxiliary aids and services, to participate in some kinds of Prius work or funding that they should get them. I think that one's pretty clear. The other one is a, what they're calling a change in policy regarding VR services um, paid for by Prius dollars for eligible students with disabilities. So, and it looks to me like they've gone through with some very specific saying, you know, if you're gonna pay for this, then you have to have these things or if a student's going to get this pre -ETS funding, it can be applied for these particular areas that pre -ETS can be spent on. Um, we will have much more about this, but that's what I've got for now. And if anybody has questions about it or really wants to dig in deep, I'd be, or has looked at it in more detail than I have, I would be more than interested to talk to somebody about that. This also ties into the work that I've talked with you guys about um, in the past around, um, Priets and VR funding of um, a variety of disability service units at colleges and universities and at the, the um, TIPS at the inclusive higher ed programs. So we'll be looking more at this one, but comments are due March 30th. Okay, next one, Andrew. A um, couple of other things that I've seen pop up. Interestingly enough, there are two webinars, both on career pathways, um, and they're like March 10th and March 11th. So I'm giving you both of them. Um, one is by the LEAD Center and the WIOA Policy Development Center, which I believe is the new one that was just funded to the Council of State Governments um, through ODA. And um, it's on strategic partnerships to create inclusive career pathways. The link is here if you want to get on it. They're talking about all kinds of collaborations, including, like I said, um, Council of State Government folks will be on it. Um, and then, so that's one collaboration piece there, and they're both around basically expanding partnerships and building collaborations, which I also thought was interesting. The second one is through the Employment First Community of Practice, and this one is a team from DC who is talking about the collaboration they've built already between um, Rehab Services Administration and their Department of Behavioral Health, um, and it includes the MOUs they've done and a variety of other things. So. If this is something you're interested in, as I say, both of them are career pathways and both of them target specifically building partnerships, um, I commend both of them to you. Uh, next slide. Uh, foster care. This one, I am always on the lookout. We talk a lot, or we, we comment a lot, I guess, in the disability community about the, the prevalence of disability among youth in foster care. I don't always see a lot of data on this, and um, this one was interesting because it's looking at youth with disabilities transitioning from foster care, so it's the older youth, and particularly the prevalence at age 17 of disability among older youth, and then looking at the differences in educational and employment outcomes at age 21 among youth with and without disabilities. Um, so, you know, looking to try to see if there are promising practices and policies, or if there are things that we need to tailor that would impact the employment of this population. Um, again, I thought it was interesting. We talk about the prevalence in foster care, but we don't always see, and this one comes from Children and Youth Services Review, so it isn't, didn't come from a disability-specific um, journal, and I thought that also was interesting. It's a conversation where certainly the folks from Promise, who will be talking to us, um, Kelly and David will be talking more, but the folks who have worked on the Promise Project have been having this conversation. Um, and I know some of the rest of you have, but I haven't always seen it coming from this side. So I thought this one was really interesting too, and it's brand new. Next slide, Andrew. Um, the next one, um, CBOs. So community-based organizations, this one is not targeted specifically to disability. This one is another one that's come out of, I talk about um, workforce GPS a lot and things I see there. 
This one I thought was interesting. It's um, how CBOs, community-based organizations, can make their voices heard in the WIOA planning process. And that's specifically the local decisions at the local um, WIOA board, the local workforce development boards. You know, what is it? How do you get involved? What's the local system and how does it work? Who makes those decisions? You know, how much money is at stake? What does, you know, how can you engage in this? And this one I also thought was really interesting. Again, it's not targeted specifically to disability, it's targeted to a whole variety of folks um, on how do we get community-based organizations who care about equitable access involved in that local WIOA planning process. And I think a lot of people, and I would count myself among them, don't understand well enough how the local planning process works. And to the extent that we can get CBOs um, representing or even better made up of people with disabilities involved in this process, the better we're going to be represented and the better they're going to serve the folks that we care about. So I thought this was interesting too. And again, if this one's from Workforce GPS, the link is up at the top. Next one, Andrew. Uh, yeah, so there's a special issue of the Social Security Bulletin um, that's looking at like the past 10 years of the Disability Research Disability Research Consortium, DRC, and that's made up of, it's led by Mathematica and Social Security Administration, then University of Illinois Chicago, University of Massachusetts Med School, and Virginia Commonwealth. And it's looking back on the 10 years of research they've done. Um, like I said, more than 60 studies, presentations. It's a special issue of the Social Security Bulletin. It is available, flip the side, Andrew, I think my conclusion's on the next page. Um, it's available directly through the link. Um, it looks at these topic areas, um, you know, program applicants and their ability to remain in the labor force, factors affecting participation in federal disability programs, characteristics, well-being, and employment of disability program participants, um, special populations, access to health insurance. And there's one summary article at the beginning which talks about a lot of these, and then it's got references to a bunch of others. I just thought having it all in one place and being able to look at it together, and frankly, it's a special issue from the Social Security Bulletin in and of itself, I thought was interesting and worth sharing not only with you, but worth your sharing with other people that you work with. Next one, Andrew. I have another two slide one. Yeah, universal design practices. Um, this is from the Neidler Disability and Rehab Research Project, um, and specifically around universal design um, the Universal Design Practices to Enhance Work Outcomes. There's a link to that website on this slide, and there's another link in a minute to um, the actual universal design stuff. But the purpose of this is increasing knowledge about the availability of access to universal design accommodations. And um, flip to the next slide, Andrew. I was interested in the website, but then they've come out with this brand new video series of the seven principles of universal design. Um, and I thought that was interesting too. These are not specifically tied to um, employment. The website on the previous slide is tied specifically to universal design and employment. And I just hadn't seen it before. Um, and maybe you guys are all familiar with all this stuff, but the more that I see universal design stuff out there, uh, particularly tied to work, I think that's really interesting. Um, we're seeing it in, for instance, its definition of universal design got put into the um, Perkins Reauthorization Act for, for um, um, CTE last year. Um, there's some places where this is showing up and the fact that this laid out and in a video form, I thought that was also interesting, you know, variety of, con of um, ways to learn. So I thought that was an interesting one too. And I commend that one to you. The link for that is there. Um, it's on YouTube. Next one, next slide, Andrew. Uh, let's see, this one I also, this one I thought was fascinating. I don't often bring you um, international stuff. I, I just am not as good at pulling the international stuff and I'm gonna try and work harder at that because I think it's, it's something that's um, useful to look across the world. This one is looking at disabled people's organizations, DPOs, and how they, in, they tried increasing access to services and improving well-being by um, using low-cost interventions, and specifically by promoting new dis disabled people's organizations. So what they did was, um, and this is specifically in low and middle-income countries, 
and specifically within that, they looked at North India. So what they did was they took uh, 527 participants in 39 villages, they divided them into a control and an intervention group, and people with disabilities were facilitated with some very small funding to form disabled persons organizations, um, including some support for events and other, vis and other things, being able to see how other, other DPOs worked. And next slide, Andrew. Um, what was interesting, the conclusions was that but just by doing this, just by promoting the DPOs, that's an effective way of improving participation, access, and well-being. And that it's a way that in a cost-effective intervention that um, in some, uh, some of these places that don't have a lot of money that you can really promote um, better services and um, more disability inclusion. And it looks like it really supported that. Um, so I thought this one was fascinating and an option that I hadn't thought about in the, particularly in this way um, as promoting services in a different way. So I thought this was interesting too. Next one. Let's see, is that the end of mine? I may have, oh, one more from, uh, maybe one more after that. Uh, it's the, I, we have a lot of anniversaries this year. I don't know if you guys have been seeing, so it's the 30th anniversary of ADA. It's an anniversary for IDEA, although I'd have to think about which one it is, 45 maybe. Um, it's the 100th anniversary of vocational rehabilitation. Department of Ed and Rehab Services Administration are celebrating all year. They've built a special website they're beginning to populate that website with a variety of things they've done. There's a podcast up there now um, with the RSA commissioner talking about it. There's a webcast where there's uh, transition experiences and success stories where um, the commissioner, um, Mark Schultz, moderated a panel. There's more things to come. Um, they're working really hard at doing this and getting some good stories out there. One of the reasons I share just is in general to share the information. Another of the reasons I share it is to, to suggest sending stuff along to them. If you've got good success stories, they are looking for stories to promote. And I know they're taking kind of a month by month approach with different targeted um, topics. I think Mark, I think February was transition month. But um, if you've got some good stories and you have a contact at RSA, I reach out and just talk about your story and see if it's something they were willing to promote. That's, that's always a good outcome. And the last slide, I think there's one more, exactly. So the Annual Disability Statistics Compendium was released on February 11th, if you didn't join us. With um, great it fanfare, great, it was released. It yeah. was, it was a great event. I was gonna say that, it was a great event on February 11th. The materials are now up there, the presentations, the videos, the transcripts, everything's up there. Here's the link for that. Okay, I think that's the end of my stuff. Let me move on. I am really excited to get to introduce the next two people who are our speakers today. Um, Kelly Nye Langerman um, is a research associate at, no, you're, you're the director of community living. That's, no, no, director of community living and employment at the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration, um, assistant director of the Research and Training Center on Community Living. She also has been um, a part of the Promise Technical Assistance Team. Um, along with the folks um, here at AUCD. Um, David Johnson, who I'm, I kind of feel silly about introducing David because he's somebody everybody kind of knows. But anyway, David Johnson, also University of Minnesota, Department of Organizational Leadership Policy and Development. Um, he and Kelly have been working together with the Promise TA Center, or on behalf of, the, I guess, the Promise TA Center and ICI Minnesota, on um, a lessons learned document on Promise and since we've had people from Promise speak on these, um, on these calls before, during the process, as we were kind of learning, we thought it might be really nice for Kelly and David to come speak as we're, uh, as we're closing down the program and uh, about the new document, about other things that we've learned. I'm gonna toss it to you guys and let you take it away. Um, welcome, welcome, and I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank, thank you, Denise, for that introduction. Uh, again, I'm Kelly, and this is my lovely colleague, David, and we're going to go through a slide deck with you today focused on a lesson learned report that we just released um, as part of our work with the Promise TA Center. Uh, next slide, please. 
So first and foremost, I'd like to uh, direct folks to uh, a couple of different websites to take a peek so you can download reports and find a little bit more information, both the promisetacenter.org as well as the Association of University Centers on Disability or AUCD.org are places you can get more information. So I wanted to do a plug there to start. Next slide, please. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, David's going to provide some background and context for uh, why promise and some additional information or things to think about what are the critical issues in youth transition, especially for those youth who are receiving SSI. I'm going to spend a couple of, well, a very short amount of time doing a quick overview of promise just again to remind everybody the context and the structure of the project itself. And then we're going to walk through a few of the lessons learned from this particular project and then leave you with uh, three or four additional uh, resources and opportunities to learn more about this report as well as um, post promise findings as well. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over here to David and he has a couple of slides to talk a little bit about context and background for promise. I'm sure for some of you, this is very uh, fundamental information, but I think it's important to set the context. I think we have to think about this in terms of kids who are 14 to 16 years of age um, and their families and trying to negotiate a process here of thinking about the future. And that's a very, uh, very challenging element for them at that age level if you get their parents around the table to start discussing this. I think that, you know, I had the opportunity to be on the original design team for Promise. And a lot of what, uh, a lot of concerns came up about all this entire process, which I think are reflected in some of our lessons learned that we'll get at later. But for our purposes here to set a context, yeah, under the, you know, I think many of us are aware that under the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, which is a mouthful to say, um, is that when young people reach the age of 18, they have to go through a redetermination process, right? Using the more stringent adult criteria, which is really uh, based on substantial gainful activity. We know that about 60% of the SS child SSI recipients go on to receive uh, SSI as adults. I will say from work we've done uh, over the years is that the 60% is highly variable across states and even within jurisdictions of states. So we have uh, that kind of play going on. Of those who exit the program, that 40% who experience cessation, there are a certain percentage that do come back on the rolls as um, they meet the criteria uh, going forward. Um, there are appeals processes for that too. The uh, other part of it is, is that when we look at this, and we'll look at it the next slide, but not quite yet, uh, you know, the positive graduation, post-secondary education, and employment outcomes are, are influenced by some of these factors, and they've been difficult to achieve with kids who remain on the SSI program. The issue around long-term dependence was certainly on the table for the Social Security Administration, um, as that SSI persists as a national concern. There's a lot of studies, and I'm sure, Andrew, you have uh, been involved in, in a number of them. SSI and uh, youth and families also face very significant challenges in terms of coming to grip with the program and the eligibility and the future and the loss of benefits, um, parent expectations and these kinds of things and lack of information to move forward are all part of it. Next slide. Well, the context for this, uh, as you look at this in terms of these youth, there's lots of statistics and lots of factors can be thrown out here, but I'm just going to walk through them very, very quickly here as we need to get on. The, you know, low educational attainment rates here, we know that about 39% did not have a high school diploma who are currently and not currently attending any educational programs um, who are part of the SSI uh, uh, youth. The uh, low employment rates have been mentioned here overall. I think it's the lower percentage of employment rates, obviously, for individuals who are transitioned to the adult SSI. Um, there's not been much movement on that program, as we are all aware, for uh, years and years and years and years, and many studies to get, uh, confirm that. We also know that post-secondary education rates, likely in turn with employment rates and other types of goal attainment, um, have persisted to be very low for individuals who are uh, remain on SSI. Um, surprisingly also, the, the low rates in vocational rehabilitation. Um, a study here it's, uh, basically said only 13% had ever received services from a VR agency. So there's a little movement in that direction uh, for these young people. And other factors are associated with some of these uh, issues of uh, these youth that, you know, in terms of uh, high rest rates, different kinds of disconnection overall. And as I mentioned, many challenges for parents. Um, 
that were kind of addressed uh, within the uh, promise uh, that model demonstration. But I'm going to turn it to Kelly. Next slide, please. And so to remind everybody here for um, a few of the details about promise in particular, when you think about the points that David shared in those last previous slides and thinking about the context of why something like promise would uh, be so exciting or show so much promise um, was part of the model or a significant part of the model was uh, the collaboration between a number of federal agencies. And so six grants were awarded, but it was a collaboration between four federal agencies being Health and Human Services, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, and the Social Security Administration. And while there have been cross federal projects in the past, when we go through sort of how they were arranged and how services looked, there are some unique features about Promise. And so for this particular uh, award process for Promise projects, they had five years to implement a model demonstration project and they were targeting youth who were between the ages of 14 and 16 who were receiving SSI benefits as well as their families. And really what we were also looking at within the, promise, um, within the Promise Model Demonstration Projects were looking at what were the evidence-based practices that currently existed in the severe or the sphere of transition services and supports, testing those as well as providing sort of an enhanced or a bit of a wraparound model for family. Um, in addition, a TA Center for the Promise Project itself was awarded in 2014. Um, and we're just, all of the projects are just ending some of their second no cost extension years um, as of this year. Next slide, please. The states that you'll see up here are states that were model demonstration projects, although I mentioned that there were six projects total. One of the projects was a collaboration or a partnership between a number of Western states, and that was the Aspire project. And Aspire included North and South Dakota, Montana, Colorado, Utah and Arizona. So that conglomeration of states together was the Aspire model demonstration project. And there's some very interesting and unique experiences about Aspire being a cross state collaboration as well. Next slide, please. So the design um, simply stated was again, our target population of eight youth ages 14 to 16 who were receiving SSI benefits. And overall across the entire five years for the life of the project, they recruited over 13,000 youth again, ages 14 to 16. And another very, ex I think, exciting and um, different piece about the Promise Initiative was is there was an experimental research design using randomized control, uh, using a randomized control model to um, sort and designate groups of youth and families in the intervention group and in the control group. Because again, the control group um, was receiving services as, un or as usual, whereas the intervention group was ex receiving these enhanced services. So next slide. Those enhanced services or those core features that model demonstration projects had to have were state aid or uh, relationships across state agencies, but the services that the intervention group received were case management, benefits council and financial capability services, um, paid or uh, work experiences and parent training and information. And as part of their projects, they had to um, do outreach and recruitment, as well as provide technical assistance to their state agency um, and local agency partners. Next slide, please. And so when you think about all of those states, all of that federal investment, all of that state infrastructure, all of the local level engagement that was happening over the course in the life of the project, what did we learn? Well, we don't have the, I would say, the definitive findings on the impact of promise at this point. We will in the future through our uh, national evaluators at Mathematica. There were a number of us within the federal agencies and within the projects that really said, what were the lessons that we learned across all states? Next slide, please. And that really was the impetus for this lessons learned report, that it was funded through uh, the federal partners at the Department of Education through the Auth Office of Special Education with funds directed at the TA Center. But there really was this desire for common lessons or common language that we would be able to share with um, uh, policymakers, with federal partners, with state agency leadership, and even at local levels to say, what, what did we learn about how do you deploy a complex intervention like this? And what did we learn about the individuals, communities, and organizations that we worked with as part of the project? Next slide, please. So one of the things that you will find in the report for all six of the model demonstration projects are state profiles um, that identified key variables. 
Um, for folks who regularly work and operate in the employment policy space, um, well, probably many corners of our industry is that it's really hard to find variables sometimes to compare states and projects and programs next to each other. And so what we try to do in these state profiles were the common definitions that all projects shared um, related to uh, demographics about individuals, some background about earnings um, and work experiences, backgrounds on additional racial and ethnic uh, demographics. We tried to capture those in a way that helped people just take a snapshot of what promise looked like in each of these states. Uh, California is shown on this slide, but next slide please. Um, the, state or the state profiles did have to include a number of data sources, and that was particularly challenging even for a coordinated federal project such as Promise. Um, so what you see in these state profiles is using data from the national evaluators, which was Mathematica Policy Research, and they collected data at a, a number of different points in time are still working on that national evaluation. So that's where some of these numbers come. In addition, we also collected data from um, the, project, the project and the project directors themselves. This example that you see there um, is Maryland. Next slide, please. And when you put it all together, you get, some, you get a page that looks like this. You can't see all of this, but what we're trying to share is that there is some visualization about the numbers and some of the early um, outcomes and backgrounds about each particular project. Next slide, please. So when we get into sort of those key themes and key lessons learned across the project, I don't think there were necessarily any really significant surprises. However, what it has provided us in doing this report, as well as working with projects um, across Promise through the TA Center, is that there's some common themes that we're able to have some data, um, as well as some anecdotal experience from working with the projects to say, in order to facilitate and support positive post-school outcomes for youth on SSI, we need interagency collaboration. We need family engagement. We need quality service delivery that's able to meet the needs of youth and families. We need strong leadership within agencies, within state agencies, local agencies, and leadership from our federal partners. And we also need a comprehensive plan of professional development within all of those spheres as we're supporting individual youth and families to be able to provide the best evidence-based practices as well as provide services with fidelity. In this particular case, it was really important as a research project, but that professional development component and training and support of staff across systems was very valuable and did come through in this. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk about five lessons related to partnership. You can learn more about these if you read through the um, read through the report. And again, I think for people that are working and operating in this space today, there aren't necessarily going to be any surprises in particular. The idea of having shared values and beliefs or sort of that raised expectation for youth with disabilities was clearly found and articulated across multiple systems and projects. It was very, very clear, and again, having documented evidence in terms of these collaborations and partnerships is that you had to have players from all of these different spheres related to education and housing and healthcare and behavioral health to help manage the complexity of supports um, to ensure that youth are on a trajectory to employment and post-school success. For those of you that like uh, some of the data components, um, and I actually think I would argue that it's important in a lot of different areas, is that memorandums of understanding across state agencies were incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I apologize for that. Um, that memorandums of understanding um, and interagency agreements were critical in being able to share and disseminate information and to have common data points and common variables, again, doesn't sound very exciting or particularly interesting. I'll tell you in some ways it could really make or break what we were, what stories we were be able to tell um, in our research based on those, uh, those data points and MOUs. Next slide, please. Um, and then, oh, there we go, allowing flexibility for the development um, and implementation. So even though each of the model demonstration projects had the core services that we were providing, they had fidelity plans around implementation, there were some unique features about each particular Promise project. And if you read 
a number of the Mathematica evaluation and process reports, you will pick up on those. Um, that said is in order to be able to meet the meet needs of transition age youth and family, having that state and local level context to be able to deploy even a federal program and a federal initiative was really critical to the success of Promise and really critical to the engagement um, and uh, long-term engagement of youth and families. And then sharing information about uh, sharing information about youth and families across agencies um, remains really a significant challenge. There's some exciting things that states are doing um, regarding um, sharing information post-promise um, that really was, promise was an impetus for that. So I'm gonna turn it over to David for a couple of slides around lessons learned on these core services. Next slide. Well, I think that one of the questions that is, I think in front of the whole effort of the Promise Initiative is whether or not with the infusion of the dollars here from the federal government, can any of these results that you've seen that Kelly presented be sustained over time? And I think there's a couple of observations that we had of this, which um, I think bears on that a little bit. I think all these lessons that have been learned help to contribute to that, but I think there's some key things to, to think about. One is the maximizing of these, uh, exist, putting dollars into existing services. Logical, you do that, so you provide bulk rehab, special ed, workforce development, county government services, and the like. Additional resources to take on this additional level of caseload. Um, the question uh, in that, of course, means that if you withdraw funds, is there capacity or uh, political will within the states to add and contribute to those resources to make uh, this move, a little, make the needle move a little bit toward helping young people achieve employment outcomes. Specialized services had to be developed as well. I can talk about those in relation to the case management structure, but this required a very extensive, aggressive almost uh, type of recruitment where they were traveling out to very rural parts of some of these states, really engaging in home visits to talk about the program, to overcome fears, concerns, to talk about the benefits of the program and the benefits of employment long-term. Very difficult, and very, very, uh, very substantial piece of what they did. The comprehensive training and technical assistance is, uh, you know, pretty much that in the first year they had to provide a lot of cross training that was supporting these uh, initiatives. A lot of different models evolved, and I think Mathematica will point out some of the effects of those. Uh, but I think that one of the most beneficial was to have people in the room who have various roles. You know, the common understanding that no one agency is going to go it alone here in terms of supporting these young people to. Uh, adult employment uh, opportunities and goals and accomplishments. Um, so it was, you know, various uh, opportunities to bring right, people from different agency contexts and perspectives and professional roles into the same type of training around a common goal or objective for these youth. The comprehensive holistic case management, I think we're going to move on to the next slide here. Okay. You know, the comprehensive holistic uh, case management services model is critical, but let me cut to the chase on this. You know, I think that one of the things that they really invested heavily in and created a specialized role was this outreach uh, activity. You know, if we look at the fundamental, you know, if you look at the agencies that are providing direct services to youth and adults uh, and families, you know, everyone's doing a little bit of case management, but there is no overarching overall person to serve in some kind of liaison or linking capacity, navigating capacity that is sustained through any one agency's funding uh, to support this kind of uh, overarching uh, goal. Certainly things such as person-centered uh, and family-centered approaches dominant in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, wraparound services and behavioral health and holistic approaches in healthcare all matter in producing these effects. But the issue is that someone needs to make these connections. And there's a real important first step in this, which was to reach out and answer questions and to educate families on a one-to-one -one level, face-to-face -face in many cases, uh, to help support them. A brochure in the mail isn't gonna make it. Um, the transition planning is an interesting thing. I've had the opportunity to work with others on this uh, over the years to try to figure out what is special education's role in conveying and sharing information. The first problem exists as to whether or not special educators even know a young person is on SSI. Very, it's too complicated to talk about in a webinar with about three minutes to go. Um, but you know, there's some assumption here that special education is just gonna basically take this and, and respond uh, to families. Uh, it's not in the training of special educators. None of this is part of their repertoire of, of competencies that they bring forth uh, through their licensure processes. Um, the issue here is that you know, they really don't, under, I mean, the, the complexities of the work incentive kinds of uh, uh, policies, procedures, and opportunities are 
very complex to explain. Um, and that's, uh, again, a gap in the whole business that we're operating in here. Number five, keep moving along here. Um, yeah, this has been something that we've all advocated for across time is that when youth have, this is to bring in the self-determination question into the context of really working with youth themselves here to give them early on as you're beginning to talk to youth, an understanding of their role in their lives to make decisions. A lot of these youth have had, you know, family members and educators and others who professionals that come in contact with basically do things for them. So the whole issue of starting to motivate kids and talk to them about options in terms of their own ability to, you know, understand themselves and to express preferences, choices, and decisions is critical. And I think that leads to a stronger adult outcome as well, which will be a subject of somebody else's research. Um, developing culturally responsive approaches. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, the Aspire Project worked with several uh, Native American um, tribal organizations in uh, those Western states. Um, it was a very challenging process to develop trust, um, to develop um, coherence in how they approached it with kind of people who were of those cultures to uh, function in that environment. But again, this is another group of people, um, various groups of people who really are um, also affected by um, the need to really take a look at long-term employment kinds of goals for young people who happen to be, in their case, also in our society. And number seven, I'm, I think we're at the end here, uh, providing accurate information on SSI. This is all part of what we know and this is a common understanding here on how we get it uh, put forward. The parent training and information centers that have been funded through the Office of Special Education Programs can and do play a role, did play a significant role in this. I think that those, you know, when you start to take about what, talk about what information is critical, that's a first place to start, even very much before even age 14, to talk about employment as a possibility for all youth, and to be very specifically talk about kind of the importance of raised expectations and be and more information about what it means to go to work uh, if you're on benefits um, to overcome those fears. So there. I think I'm going to end it there just in terms of the time frame we have here. And now, Andrew, I don't know who's going to ask questions, but sure. Yep, I was going to say, Andrew, if you could go to the slide, oh, I'm um, sorry. additional readings on promise. Yep, that was the there one. There you go. Um, because we're short on time, and I apologize that there are not more time for questions, David and I's email uh, addresses are also available on this particular slide deck. There's a slide um, kind of thinking about what happens post-Promise, but for folks who are interested in both reading this report and looking at other information about Promise, there's an open source journal of the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation. There are a number of public mathematical policy research reports. The Social Security Administration has put out a number of publications as well, and there'll be um, a future special issue on Promise findings um, in CDPEI in 2020. So um, again, however long you guys have to, to take questions or shoot emails. Um, again, David and I are happy to um, follow up with individual, individuals or groups if they have more, more questions or comments. Okay, uh, so there are two questions on, that came in online and uh, both are requesting the slide deck um, and you know, what we presented today. Uh, so we'll be sure to follow up with those folks um, who uh, are looking for the slides. They will also be posted to our, our, our website as well. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll um, oh, start my video, said somebody. Um, and so we'll send, send out to people. You know, and also I think you know, uh, it'd be worth having folks from Promise uh, back on, on the end tide again. I think this was a, a really nice summary of some of the lessons learned. I, I think about the MOUs and one piece of data I'd like to see is the average length of time and number of emails that it took to create the MOUs. And then also to learn about the terms of the MOUs in terms of their length. You know, if you think about sustainability, if, if you write it usually a five-year MOU, uh, is it an easy process to renew that MOU? Um, is, are there plans to renew the MOU uh, later? And so um, uh, this, is, this is really uh, great can stuff. Can I just make one, one shout out then sure. uh, related to that topic is uh, Ellie Hartman was the director of Wisconsin Promise. Mm -hmm. 
response and using the model that they developed through the MOU um, are expanding their data sharing and data collection across state agencies and across systems to continue to build out their management information system for cross system data collection. Yeah. All because of promise. So Ellie, um, and, and all of these issues about how do state agencies navigate these complicated uh, data points and, and learn to speak the same language so we can take sort of meaning and understanding from the services and supports that we're providing. So yeah, um, you know, it's, we have a question from Kenya. Um, from Nairobi and uh, you know the question is how how can some of our information uh, uh, be translated uh, for the situations and unique uh, uh, structure within uh, other countries like Kenya I think that's an interesting uh, question I, I don't have any quick answer given the time uh, but perhaps you could reach out to Kelly uh, and others uh, 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 more directly um, and so uh, we'll try to get the slide deck out to everybody. Um, uh, if not, uh, if you want it right away uh, and you don't see it, going to our website is probably the next best bet. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, David, very much for your presentation. Great job. Thank you uh, to Denise for her, her update from, from inside the Beltway. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, have a great weekend. And hopefully we'll see you next, week, uh, next month on the Inside. Thank you, bye-bye.